George, uh, brothers and sisters, I bring with me the loving and fraternal greetings of your brothers and sisters who meet at the Morton Bay Ecclesia. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Brisbane, Australia, where I come from, it's on the east coast. There are about 13 or 14 ecclesias in the Brisbane area and probably around 800 or so Christadelphians. And we have uh, several very close sister ecclesias, one of which Margaret and I belong to for some 35 years, and that is the Wilston Ecclesia, who formed the meeting that we now belong to. We didn't originally go out with them, but because uh, two or three of our children went out there with all of our grandchildren, <laughs> the incentive to move to Morton Bay was fairly strong, if not on me, or certainly on my lovely wife Margaret. They are now actually sleeping uh, in Australia while we're here, uh, performing what they performed about 15 or 16 hours ago. Uh, so our time has come, and we've come to reflect upon our Lord Jesus Christ this morning and to see in him the Redeemer of Israel, the Israel of God, firstly, and then, of course, Israel in the land, or at least the Jews in the land, and Israel outside the land. But I thought I might just say a few more words about Jephthah's daughter. Because, as I said, there's like a type within a type. And we really see a cameo of a father and a child, an only one, who work together for the redemption of Israel. And I have to say to you, brothers and sisters, I marvel not only at Jephthah, but I marvel even more at his daughter. Where would you find someone who not having known about the vow that was made, finds all of a sudden that she's suddenly the subject of that vow which has to be fulfilled, that wouldn't run away. Where would you find someone that wouldn't run away? Well, Isaac didn't run away. And our Lord Jesus Christ didn't run away. He could have. He could have left the Garden of Gethsemane and run away like his disciples did when he was captured and taken. But no, he didn't run away. And of course, Jephthah's daughter, having come to understand what the vow meant, why it was made, and its importance to the redemption of her people, even though they had been rejected, was important to their redemption, she is prepared to submit to the terms of that vow. And when you read these words of verse 37 of Judges chapter 11. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellow. So why, why is she bewailing her virginity? Well, because you see, she is Jephthah's only hope for continuance of some kind of earthly seed. She's not married yet. And she's not going to marry. No seed will come forth to him. His earthly inheritance is gone. She knows that. And she's bewailing that fact. But of course, by doing what she's doing, she's securing for herself an inheritance that will be permanent. An inheritance in the kingdom as an immortal. Through obedience to her father and to the terms of his vow. She's a remarkable girl, is Jephthah's daughter. And he said in verse 38, and you know, when you read the, the brevity of his words, you know, the reason he can't get any more words out, a bit like us sometimes, fathers, isn't it, when you're dealing with a, a child, an obedient child, you can't say too many words because you break down into tears. He just says, go, go. He's overwhelmed. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. So three times we are reminded that the end of Jephthah's family had arrived. He would not be able to perpetuate his seed in the earth through natural means. She was his only hope. He had to look beyond that, brothers and sisters, to the kingdom age. 
for the time when he will be there with his daughter and all of the faithful from all ages and rejoice in the things that Yahweh, our covenant God, has done for us through his only one, which we've come to remember this morning. And when it says there in verse 40, the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament, the word lament in the Hebrew, tana, means to ascribe something to or to celebrate or to commemorate. There are only two occurrences of that Hebrew word in the Old Testament. The other one is in Judges chapter 5 and verse 11 in the story of Deborah. And Judges 5 verse 11 we read this. The words in italics in the AV at the beginning of that verse can, of course, be ignored. It should read this way. The noise of those who divided the spoil was heard in the places of the drawing of water. In other words, Sisera and his men were messing up Israel's life. There shall they rehearse. Here is our word. The only other occurrence of the word in the Hebrew, the word Tanah, rendered rehearse in Judges 5 verse 11. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of Yahweh, the righteous acts of his rulers, as that should be rendered, not villages, the righteous act of his rulers, meaning Deborah and Barak. Then shall the people of Yahweh go down to the gates. Now that's telling us something. What that word means is to commemorate now, what are we doing this morning? Well, we're commemorating, aren't we? We're commemorating the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so powerful was the example of Jephthah's daughter for her <coughs> fellows in Israel that every single year they would go up for four days to commemorate and to rehearse her faithful acts. She was remembered by her own people. So that is where she ends up in the scheme of things. She's unquestionably in the book of life. And we're going to see that young lady one day. We're going to see the quality, the quality that brings her to immortality. And those of us, particularly our younger sisters, those who are unmarried, you've got a model, haven't you? You've got a model in Jephthah's daughter to follow. Well, we come now to Judges chapter 12. Having dealt with, with the, the questions surrounding his daughter and the vow, etc., we now come to a section of scripture that speaks of Christ's work among the Jews who are outside the land. Now I'm sure that all of you are pretty familiar with the two stages in the deliverance of Jacob. Jacob being a name used of all Israel, both the Jews in the land and the Jews outside the land of the return of Christ. That's why it says in Romans 12, the deliverer shall come to Zion and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That means he's got to deal with the Jews in the land and he's got to deal with the Jews who are outside the land. Now we know from Zechariah 12 verse 7 that Christ will save the tents of Judah first. And when you come to the prophetic scriptures, there is a formula which of course you'll often hear me talk about and I, I do it for a reason because this is not as well understood in our community as it might be, and mistakes have been made in certain writings because this formula is not understood. And you can check this out, I've been doing it for 30 years, I know it's true. Whenever you are reading in the prophetic scriptures about the people in the land at the return of Christ, not, not about the land, the people living in the land of Israel, as it's called today, when you're reading about the people in the land of the return of Christ, they are always called Judah. Always. But when you're reading about the people who are outside the land of the return of Christ, they are called three things. They are called Ephraim, Israel, and the remnant of Jacob. Now check me out on that. When you do your daily readings in the prophets, have a look at the context, and when you come across any one of those names, check out the context, and you will see that this is perfectly sound. It is true on every occasion. The only problem you're going to have is Isaiah 11. If you've got a problem with that, come and talk to me, because it's not a problem. 
But every other place where you will find these names, this formula works. It's true. The people in the land when Christ comes for the events of Armageddon are called Judah. The people outside the land are called Israel, Ephraim and the remnant of Jacob. So who are we meeting here in Judges 12 verse 1? Who are they? And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together. So we meet Ephraim. And as soon as you read Ephraim and you know you're in a prophecy, because this is what this is, a prophecy, you're dealing with the Jews who are outside the land at the return of Christ. So that's the theme of Judges chapter 12 verses 1 to 7. It's about Christ's dealings with the Jews who are outside the land when he comes. What we've been considering up to this point, to the end of chapter 11 in type, refers to the Jews who are in the land. All right, so he, he's got two jobs. He's got to purge the people in the land. He's got to purge the people who are outside the land. And they are prophetically called Ephraim in the word of God. So having established that, and you can make that absolutely firm in your own mind by your own consideration uh, in your daily readings or in your own studies, we know where we are in this context. Christ's dealings with the Jews dispersed outside the land. So let's read verse 1 again. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. We have a good read of Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 talks about Ephraim envying Judah. All right? and Judah having strong feelings against Ephraim. What's the context of Isaiah 11? Setting up of the kingdom. The second exodus of Israel. That's the context. You have to get the words when Yahweh goes out the second time to redeem Israel. It's about the second exodus of Israel. You've got this conflict between the Jews in the land and the Jews outside. Them. That's going to happen prior to Armageddon. It will happen after Armageddon. So you got that hinted at here. Verse 2. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. When I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. Do you think the Jews living outside the land will have a real interest in the problems of their brethren in the land? No. They're too much into their wealth and their money and their businesses and their pleasures. When I saw that you delivered me not, he says, verse 3, I put my life in my hands and I passed over against the children of Ammon and Yahweh delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then have you come up against me this day to fight against me? So war breaks out. Verse 4, Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites, and among the Manassites. So there's strife which leads to conflict. So what's this all about, brothers and sisters? Well, you know, it's about the type, but it's about a lot more as well, because we can learn a lot of things from what happens here at the fords of Jordan. And it is at the fords of Jordan that this happens. Look at verse 5. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Are you an Ephraimite? And if he said, Nay, they asked him a question. And we'll come to that question in a moment. But the fords of Jordan is, of course, a reference to the place where Israel crossed. So when you read the fords of Jordan, read the waters of baptism because that's where John was baptizing that's where Jesus was baptized that's where Israel was baptized so this is the waters of baptism read ports of Jordan baptism so the Gileadites take the forts or the passages of Jordan now what had happened here was that the Ephraimites had come across the Jordan from their inheritance in Ephraim 
on the western side of Jordan. They were one of the largest tribes on the western side. And because they were very upset with Jephthah and his people, they came across the Jordan. They used the passage of the Jordan. They came across and they did battle in Gilead. And they lost. And now they want to go home. They want to go home to their inheritance, Ephraim. Well, there's a condition on which they're going to be allowed to go home. And most of them, in fact 42,000 of them, can't meet that condition. Now 42,000 is the number that perish at the end of verse 6. What's the significance of that, do you think? Well, 42 is made up by multiplying 6 and 7. 6 times 7 is 42. So what we have here is the number of men and the number of the covenant. And a thousand to a Jew represented a family. And what we're going to see come out of this record are the principles that have to do with Yahweh's covenant. If you want an inheritance in his land, they want to go back to where they belong, see? These people, they want to go back to where they came from. But the conditions upon which you're allowed to go back are laid out in what happens here. This is why we have this question asked. Say now, Shibboleth. Now, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes, he's going to use precisely the same principles that are used here by Jephthah and the Gileadites. Say now, Shibboleth. You know what Shibboleth means? Look it up in the Hebrew, it means a stream or a flood. So where are they? Well, they're at the fords of Jordan. And probably this is the season when you have to be there because Jordan's in flood. This is the only place you can get across. All right? Normally Jordan, you could get across in many places, but not in the floods, not in the harvest season. So if it's harvest season and Jordan is in flood, then they're watching something, aren't they, when they arrive at the Jordan? Just try and create the picture in your minds, brothers and sisters. This is very important. These Ephraimites have gone across. They've been defeated. Now they want to go home. They come to Jordan in flood. What are they looking at? A stream or a flood. True? That's what Shibboleth means. So what Jephthah is asking them is, you people who want to get back into the land and go back to your inheritance, what are you looking at? What do you have to cross to get back to your land? You have to go through the waters of baptism, don't you? You have to go through this stream or flood. So what did they say? Verse 6. They said unto him, unto him Say now Shibboleth, and he said, Sibboleth. You know what Sibboleth means? It means an ear of grain. An ear of grain. So if this is harvest season, if this, this is the time of flood, you know, around the month A bit, bit beyond, time of flood, what are they looking at when they're looking over the Jordan to the fields beyond. But well, they're looking at the fields, white to the harvest, aren't they? So here are these people who want to get back to their inheritance, but between them and their inheritance is the waters of baptism. Say now, Shibboleth, what are the conditions that you can cross back to your inheritance? Shibboleth! Shibboleth means an ear of corn or grain. They're looking at the fields beyond. And our Lord Jesus Christ said this in John chapter 12 and verse 24. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. There's a principle in that, isn't there? You want an inheritance in the land? Then you've first got to go through the waters of baptism. You've got to die in order to live. That's the principle. And these people didn't understand it. Their speech betrayed them. 
Now I want to show you something, brothers and sisters, about verse 6, because the translation here is not perfect. It says, And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. It sounds as though the men of Ephraim had a speech impediment. You know, the Benjamites were left-handed. There are certain characteristics. Australians have certain characteristics. Texans have certain characteristics. It's a matter of culture, isn't it? Background, culture, history. Yes, and there was a history here. There was a reason why they said Sibboleth and not Shibboleth. We want to point that history out. Let me just explain to you what's happened here. In the Tel El Armana letters, you've heard of them, haven't you? Dug up in the land, the Tel El Armana letters. And you'll find this in a number of Bible dictionaries. It says in, West, in the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, Amon Hotep IV, who was Pharaoh from 1387 to 1366 BC, built a new capital which he named Ak, Ak Hetaton. It was situated on the east bank of the Nile River about 160 miles above the Delta and, and nearly 300 below Thebes. The modern name is Tel El Aman. Here were found in the year 1887 more than 350 clay tablets. They were written in Akkadian, the international language of the 15th and 14th centuries BC, and proved to be the correspondence of the vassal princes and governors in Syria and Palestine with their overlords, Amenhotep III and IV. Nearly all of them were written in Syria and Palestine, and accordingly, they are the first hand value for the light they shed on conditions in Palestine of that period. Now guess what the Tel El Amarna letters tell us amongst many things. They tell us this, that the substitution of the S for the SH sound of the Hebrew language was an Amorite peculiarity. Shiloh, for example, is even pronounced today without an H in it by the locals. The, the locals pronounce it Silo. The Tel El Amarna letters show that this was a characteristic of the Amorite tongue. Shiloh appears in the letters as Zilu. Condor says, this has always presented the difficulty that the S is not the proper representative of the Hebrew she, S-H-I. The majority of the Ephraimites had adopted the speech and the ways of the Amorites. Now, why did they do that? Well, because they didn't exterminate them. When they crossed over the Jordan under Joshua, the Ephraimites left the Amorites in their inheritance. And what happens if you leave Amorites in your inheritance? If you have them in your ecclesia or your family, well, eventually, everyone starts talking like Amorites. And that's what happened to the tribe of Ephraim over history. As time went on through the period of the judges, the remaining Amorites had their culture seep into the culture of Israel and it leavened the whole lump so that by the time of Jephthah it was well known and Jephthah knew this that Ephraimites dropped out the SH and used S instead. Alright? So when they were asked to say Shibboleth he knew exactly what they would say. They talked like the world. They said, Sibboleth. Now that wouldn't be a problem for us, would it? We wouldn't adopt any practices of the world, would we? 
we shouldn't. But unfortunately, it's happening. So there's a real message here, brothers and sisters, for you and me. The further we go down in the path of history to the return of Christ, the worse it's going to get. Here were people who spoke like Amorites. And they didn't see any problem with this. See, see, when it says that for he could not frame to pronounce it right, this is not about some kind of speech impediment. Let me give you a better translation. Rotherham says, and he could not take heed to speak in that manner. Young's literal says, and he's not prepared to speak right. Keel and Dalish in their commentary say, he's not taking care to pronounce it correctly. So it was not inability. It was carelessness. And it cost them their lives. 42,000 of them were asked the same question and they all lost their lives because they didn't understand the principle that you have to cross the waters of baptism and live in a newness of life before you can have an inheritance in the land. And guess what is going to happen to the multitude that Elijah gathers from all parts of the earth and brings them into the wilderness of the peoples, brothers and sisters? The same thing that happened to their fathers in the wilderness under Moses. The older generation will be so steeped in the ways of the Amorites, in the way of the world, that they will have to have time to die out in the wilderness. That's why there's a 40-year second exodus. And it will be their children that come into the land, like it was in the first Exodus. With the exception, maybe, of a few, like Caleb and Joshua and Levites. That's the way it's going to be all over again. Because, you see, these people will not be able to appreciate, because of their history, they'll not be able to appreciate the need to submit to the principles of baptism. Now, we can learn a lesson from that, can't we? We can learn a very real lesson from that. Because the same principles will apply to you and me. And so we read in verse 7 that Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And after him, Ibsam of Bethlehem judged Israel. Now, I want to just finish our studies together by talking about what those two verses mean. Jephthah relinquished his judgeship in his seventh year, and so will Christ. As it were, in the seventh millennium, he will relinquish his judgeship, won't he, and give it back to God. So who does it go to here? Ibsam of Bethlehem of all places Ibsam's name means the splendid one and Christ will deliver up the kingdom to God the splendid one at the end of the 7th millennium 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24 and so what about Jephthah brothers and sisters well let's have a look at the two sides of his life let's have a look at mortal heritage on one side of the chart and spiritual heritage on the other. He was born in dubious circumstances and kicked out of his own house, disinherited by his own family and friends. But through his faithfulness he awaits resurrection to be born incorruptible and inherit eternal life. Now when you compare what this life has to offer with what the life to come has to offer, there is no comparison, is there? And if we, if we look at Jephthah and say, well, he went through a few sad things in his life, yeah, they were sad, there were problems, there were difficulties, you know, he was, he was crunched throughout his life. But where did that lead? 
It led to eternity. And he's going to be there to see all of these things that we've talked about through typology. He's going to see them all brought to pass before his very eyes. You can't compare the two, can you? You can't say that there's any equality between those two sides. Of course there's not. He was banished and hated by his brethren, but he will receive glory and honour at the feet of Christ. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, and it was the ultimate sacrifice, and let's just ponder that, brothers and sisters. Let me ask you this question. If you were Abraham, and God said to you, you take your only one, whom you love, and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice, but I'll give you an alternative, Abraham. I'll take you as a substitute. You can, you can, stay, you can go into Isaac's place. What would you do? You know, it's a little bit like the time of oppression when, when our brethren were persecuted and, and the persecutors would come along and say, one of this family is going to be killed. And they line the family up against a wall. But well, they give you an option. You make the choice of who's going to die. There wouldn't be too many fathers sitting in this room today who wouldn't say, shoot me. Shoot me. Don't shoot my children. Don't shoot my wife. Shoot me. True? I would. Right? So if you had a choice, you'd be dead yourself rather than see your family die. Now, America's got troops in Afghanistan and every week boxers arrive home, don't they? And they have ceremonies. And sadly, people have got to lay to rest, people that have died for no reason because it will lead nowhere. We know what's going to happen there. Russia's going to take over Afghanistan. All that's wasted. All right? All wasted. These lies, just wasted for nothing. And they stand there and they, they honour the dead and they say, he made the ultimate sacrifice. Wrong. The ultimate sacrifice is the one that Abraham made. to give his only beloved son. That is the ultimate sacrifice because Abraham would have preferred to die himself. They shall look upon me whom they pierced, says Yahweh, and mourn for him. And I'm going to suggest to you, it's of course it's impossible, but the type is true. You know what Christ is called in the New Testament? His death. The Father gave what's called the blood of his own. That's the phrase that's used in the New Testament. He gave his son. He gave the blood of his own. Now God doesn't have blood. He can't die. But if you had given God a choice, he would have gone to the cross. But he couldn't. So he called upon his son to do that work. Got the idea? The ultimate sacrifice is to do what Yahweh did in the giving of his son. And that's what Jephthah did. He made the ultimate sacrifice and he will reap the fruit of that sacrifice in the kingdom. Oh yes, in making that sacrifice he ended up with no earthly inheritance. But how can you compare that to an eternal inheritance in the kingdom? He died. We told that here in verse 7. Family line extinct. But it will not be long when angels will go forth. And they will wake up Jephthah and his daughter, probably buried side by side, They'll wake up Jeff and his daughter and they'll take them to the judgment seat and there's no question where they're going. They're going to the right hand. And father and daughter will be forever together in the kingdom of God and beyond. And I think, brothers and sisters, as we remember the ultimate sacrifice that our father has made that we might be there with them 
And as we reflect upon the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, I think we're going to be very, very grateful when we reach out to take bread and wine this morning. Because it will not be long and we're going to see them again. All of those faithful. And I don't know about you, but I want to stand with them at the right hand of Christ.